The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. So the reason, yep. the reason I have a concern about making explain accessible to users is because PostgreSQL supports a lot more complex query syntax than MySQL does. And with this complex query syntax comes additional explain output um, to the point where, for example, what we're seeing here is um, Hubert from Poland. Um, we're seeing his, I, uh, his PHP thing designed to help digest your explain plan. Because, for example, for a sufficiently complicated query, this is the explain plan in sort of text tree form. Um, and you can see it sort of runs off the screen here. Because this particular query, I don't know whose this is. This is off of the, the, the log on there. This particular query um, is using some common table expressions in it and they look to be reasonably complex common table expressions. Um, uh, the um, Postgres is showing you a lot of the similar things that MySQL is showing you, um, only it's showing you a little bit more detail. Um, it's not showing you a couple of other things. It's not showing you, you know, keys that it considered and didn't use. Um, I, but, um, you know, for, so for example here, um, the whole thing is sort of pictures an inverted tree, and so for example here you get, um, well let's do a much simpler example when I actually give it, but, but you can actually sort of see the level of complexity in here, which is why I'm concerned about, you know, how do we actually represent this to users in a way that they can understand it, and so where is the, oh, there's the terminal. Okay, so. What happened there? There we are. So, We? Oh, that's why. Ooh, what happened there? Let's see if I can try that again. So we've got lots of options for explain, which hopefully Bruce will go into later. But I'll do it JSON format because it's a little bit easier to read on, on a blown up screen. Is it blowing up? Oh, right. Don't use the equal signs. Can't see for the wrapping. There we go. So, for example, this would actually be sort of your simplest plan, um, except that we're getting bizarre wrapping, so hold on. Fair. Well, let's see if I can make this cooperate. Yeah. Oops. 
And then, of course, it shrinks. And then it shrinks in ways I don't want it to shrink. Yeah, on the other hand, my Linux machine is having issues with the projector, so you, we have our choice of evils. You said less why not to use Mac and more why to, to prepare your presentation ahead of time. Or, you know, well, neither, neither of us really did. I mean, you're, you're trying to show an example. So, you know. Right, because you're making it up. So, so for example, here we have like your simplest query plan, which is we're just doing a, sec, uh, a scan over one table to look for um, a particular value. So here we have, uh, so for Postgres you have these different nodes because it's representing how the planner actually, or how the executor actually, imp actually executes stuff, which is it's just sort of functional handing off to independent nodes. And so we're getting the output from each different query node that executes a different step in the query. Um, so this node is what's uh, called a sec scan, which means a full table scan. And the reason it's doing a full table scan is this table's only about four kilobytes in size, um, so it wouldn't really make sense to do anything else. Um, so, and the name of the table is product versions, and um, sometimes stuff gets aliased within the query either by the user um, or automatically if you know you've got like a subquery or something, um, and then. We get a bunch of costing information because Postgres has a cost-based optimizer. And so it wants to show you the information about the cost of the various nodes, which is how it decided what to do. Um, so the startup cost for a table scan is nothing because um, the, there's no calculation that has to be done ahead of time. Uh, the total estimated cost is 9.54 cost units, which are not related to anything else in reality. So. Um, there is a setting within Postgres where people try to calibrate cost units so that they actually relate to milliseconds of execution time, but that's always going to be approximate. Um, then the number of rows is going to return, because that's all the rows there are in this table, 93. Um, the, um, and then we get some, because I'm doing it with the analyze setting, um, the analyze setting actually runs the query and finds out what it did. Um, so it took, 0.3 milli, 0.03 milliseconds to get back the first row and 0.6 milliseconds to get back the last row um, out of 94 rows. So this here you're seeing, so one of the things that you're looking for in Postgres plans is does the query planner's estimation of how the query would run match how the query actually ran? So for example, it estimated that we were going to get 93 rows back and we got 94 rows back. So that's pretty, pretty darned accurate actually. Um, generally, from my perspective, any row within a multiple of five is actually reasonably accurate. So one-fifth to five times the estimated amount on a complicated query. Um, it only executed the scan once. Here's the filter for the scan, looking for that product name. Um, this, would, this bit would indicate whether or not there were any triggers that got fired in the course of, of uh, executing this. It's only valid for write queries. Um, you know, and then we get our total runtime. And, and this is actually pretty easy to understand for this simple of a query um, for, for users and that sort of thing. The problem is that the queries that the, that the users actually have problems with are not that simple. Um, this is the explain plan of the sort of, the sort of query that users actually have problems with. And the problem with this is it becomes uh, more or less un unreadable. There's way too much information there. Um, and like, I mean, this is the, the sort of nested text format. So like, for example, one of the things that's indicating is anytime we do an operation that has to bring two pieces of data together, like right here we're doing an append. Um, and that's where you stick one bit of data onto the end of the other. Those are done in partitioning. Those are done um, uh, when doing unions. Um, you know, you get an append. So we've got an append here, and one part of the append is a sequential scan on the facts table, um, and the second part is an index scan um, on a second portion of the facts table. So they're, 
they're actually putting, they're doing two different criteria over the facts table and unioning it to itself. Um, and here's your index condition um, and the filter. Um, so actually, n sample must be not true for most rows if we're using an index on a Boolean column. The, um, so, you know, and looking at sort of these individual things, but if you look at this in general and you say this query is running really slow, why? Um, it's not very helpful, um, except to sort of, uh, I mean, even for me, this, this particular thing is going to be a little bit baffling. Um, so we have sort of our start of some stuff, you know, more accessible because, I mean, Hubert constructed this thing and it actually parses that output and breaks it up and actually tries to figure out where you're spending your time. God, given the complexity of that query, that seems two, two seconds, 2.5 seconds seems pretty fast, actually. But whoever was doing this was clearly not happy with it, or they wouldn't have put this on the, uh, on the explain plan. Um, so he's breaking this up and trying to actually highlight some of the common problem conditions, like um, showing the exclusive and inclusive times for queries. So like, actually, the funny thing about this query is it's doing all of this complicated stuff, and all that complicated stuff um, only takes a couple hundred milliseconds. And most of our time, as far as I can tell, is being spent on doing the last sort and uniqueifying of the output data, um, which is interesting. But. Ah, okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, but so we're trying to show. Hmm? Oh yeah, for the mic. Yeah, sorry, I was getting the inclusive and exclusive columns mixed up on Hubert's output. So with that one, actually, it was only taking five milliseconds to do the last step, and the rest of it was for the rest of the query, which makes more sense. Um, if you're looking here, you can see he's trying to highlight common problems. Like, for example, one of the common problems is when the estimate for the amount of data that's going to be returned from a particular step is very different from the actual, from the reality. Because then often the query planner will choose a different plan than the one that would be optimal. Um, you know, if it thinks it's going to return five rows and it actually returns 500,000 rows, or vice versa. It's going to choose a different query plan and the different query plan won't necessarily be the one that would be best for the data that you have. And so um, Hubert here is trying to highlight things like, um, you know, here's a multiple where this is saying it's 400 and 425X off in the upwards direction. Um, so the, um, you know, and that's a little bit helpful to spot common problems, but it's not quite adequate, and one of the things that uh, this view doesn't really help you with is figuring out which steps are part of which other steps. Yeah. Uh, yes, actually. Extremely similar. Um, in fact, it's even called analyze. So um, what you would do actually here would be like that uh, for analyze table. There's a daemon that runs in the background that actually keeps track of writes to tables. And when you hit a certain threshold, it'll, it'll automatically analyze them in the background. Um, and then that all goes into it all goes into a system catalog, and this is actually a simplified summary view of that system catalog that has all kinds of statistics on tables, including um, including that's uh, actually hold on, let's do this. So what you get here is 
um, whether or not the table's inherited from another table, the fraction, this is for a particular column here, the fraction of nulls, um, the average width of that column, the indistinct estimate, that is the number of distinct values as a factor um, of the, it, it'll either be an absolute number if it's positive. And here's, here we're doing magic numbers actually in the system catalogs. If it's positive, it's an absolute number. If it's negative, that's actually a fraction. So for example, this is saying that basically approximately 80% of the table are distinct values. Um, uh, the, um, and the rest are not. Um, yeah, I think so. Anyway, the, um, and then here we've got our most common values, histogram, um, and uh, the frequencies of those most common values, um, and then histogram bounds for bucket, bucketing the table. Um, Yes. I was always curious as to why if you do a plan to build an element expected to find, it would then run a query which, despite all logic, would statistically show that. Why is it like kind of always stubborn that, hey, some databases can you know, maybe stay consistent over time, but it never has something that gets done here. Is there something that goes for that? No, there isn't. I mean, the, I mean, the thing obviously is the asynchronous thing of that it tries to keep track of table activity and trigger analyzes to refresh the statistics. But if that's not working for some reason, like such as users have turned it off, um, then there isn't really a way in Postgres. We've talked a number of times um, about um, doing, say, some form of query abort. That is, if you start on a query and you start on a, on a, you plan out, the planner plans the query, and it starts on a step and it's expecting 50 rows back from something and it gets 50 million rows, that at that point, maybe we should abort and replan. The problem is that if we aborted and replanned, what would we abort and replan based on? You know, at that point, the only thing that would be sensible to do to actually get a new good plan would be to, in fact, analyze every table touched by the query. Um, which might be a good feature to have, but we don't have it yet. Um, the, the other thing that we've actually talked about a number of times, but because of the complexity of it haven't implemented, um, is this idea of, not just having a statistic of cost of plans, but also having a statistic of the level of risk of plans. That is, how risky is this particular um, plan choice if it turns out that I'm wrong about what's in the table? Um, because there's certain things that Postgres does to optimize performance that when they're right, makes things much faster, but when they're wrong, makes things much, much slower. Like, um, we have this thing called index scan abort, where Say that you're actually returning something in the order that a particular index is in, and you put a limit 20 on it. And Postgres assumes that that particular value that you're looking for um, is extremely, that your filter condition is extremely frequent in the table. You know? So, so you're saying where status equals active. And according to Postgres statistics, 70% of the rows have static equals active, so it's only going to have to scan the index for a couple of milliseconds to find those first 20 rows and return them, right? Um, but if it turns out to be wrong, like if it turns out that only 2% of the table has, um, has, uh, you know, has uh, status equals active, then it's going to all of a sudden be scanning and checking a large portion of the index, which is going to be extremely slow. Um, and so that's actually kind of, it's a high risk plan. That is, if it turns out your statistics are wrong, the penalty for using that plan in terms of execution time is going to be very high. Problem is that, Cost-based, the cost-based planner is difficult and complicated enough having only one metric of query estimation, which is the estimated cost. Um, if we add a second metric, the estimated risk, then we've just at least doubled the complexity of the planner. Um, so we don't really have a solution for that. I mean, it's, it's a real problem and that sort of thing. Um, we've done a few things to fix common cases. Like for append-only table, one of the chronic problems that we had for append-only tables is, for append-only tables, you're often actually searching for the rows that happen 
that have been inserted most recently, because you often want to see the most in recent data. Um, but then, um, but then that's the data that's the least likely to be analyzed because it just went into the table. And so it used to be that you would do a search on that and what it would return would be, um, it would estimate that there were no rows matching your query and therefore it would use a plan like a nest loop that's very appropriate for, for something that it doesn't think is going to return any rows. Um, so we did do a bypass in that case, which is if you ask, if the user's running a query where they they're have a filter condition that's deliberately asking for rows that Postgres think is past the last bucket, of the histogram bounds, first step is the planner checks the index. Um, actually, the optimizer checks the index on the table to say, hey, are there any rows past the end of this histogram bucket? And then the index will return an answer of that because we have the index statistics, which are going to be up to date. Um, and then we're going to use that instead for the plan. Um, and so that really helped that particular case. But it's not generalized to other cases of having the wrong statistics. Um, the other thing that we haven't implemented, and I think Oracle may have done a better job on, is going beyond the histogram bucket model to actually understand certain common patterns with data, like, for example, normal distributions. Um, Postgres treats all data as if it was randomized um, in terms of the query planning, which works for a lot of data, but doesn't work for data that follows, say, um, a linear progression or um, or normal form or whatever, um, that those, it, it ends up still making um, no better and in fact sometimes worse um, estimates on data that have those sort of predictable mathematical patterns as it does in data that's randomized. So these are all areas to, to work on. Um, and our primary limitation is it's very hard to find people who want to hack on the query planner because it's really complicated and most of the time when you try things, they don't work. So, okay. Yeah, so I mean, that's the basic idea, and I feel like, you know, things like this, like Hubert's is sort of a first step, but I feel like we're getting to a point where we have explain output you know, and, and I'm beginning to see this with my SQL now having better explain output that, that's very useful for me and Shiri and you and not useful for the majority of our users because they're, they're drowning in too much information that requires way too much knowledge to make any sense out of. Yeah, I don't know if that would be, because the, the problem is that what's actually wrong in the query, what's actually taking time is often, oh, that's the one I was looking at before, is often pretty far down in the query somewhere. Right, but um, in, in the old style of explaining my SQL, yeah. they don't even have time. It's just here's what the team used and here's the type of uh, data access strategy we used. So we did a sequential, we did a ready scan on X. Yeah. Like Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the problem is that in a lot of cases in Postgres, what the user really wants to know is what action can I take to fix this query? So, for example, often what you'll have is you'll come down and you'll find the really slow step is a sort somewhere. And, and if, for example, this actually said sort method, it actually said tape sort which would mean an on-disk sort, you know, and that it required, you know, and that the space required was, say, you know, 40 megabytes. Then the user, you know, then the conclusion of somebody like me is I look at them and say, oh, hey, raise work mem to 64 megabytes, and then this will go back to an in-memory sort, and it'll be much faster. Um, the problem is that 
the user's interface to that is me um, or some other Postgres expert. Um, and, you know, and, and we've been sort of starting to talk about you know, how do we actually get beyond, I mean, we still need this output for the experts for when things really go wrong, but we need a different form of output that that basically, uh, I mean, essentially, I mean, my first thought is something that's like offers suggestions that doesn't analyze, you know, that goes through all the different parts and looks for common patterns and says, you might need to analyze table X or you might need, one of the really complicated ones to figure out, at least in Postgres, is you might need an index on this particular column. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's hard for me to believe that, that this problem isn't solvable. I just haven't seen a good example of it from any other database um, in terms of providing users with easy to understand information that they can immediately take action on. Like, the Oracle stuff is actually much worse because it supplies much more data without making that data any more digested than it is for Postgres. Um, yeah? The problem is that, that even that, because I've looked at that, I actually supply some simple queries to look at that and they're on my blog and that sort of thing. It would be useful to actually put those together in a tool. Um, but even then, one of the problems we always run into in the community is we get arguments over the algorithm. Because it's easy to say, the, the part of the index is never used is easy, but what about an index that's extremely seldom used? You know, at what level of seldom do you recommend to the user that they get rid of it? Because cause the thing is that, I mean, what if the user index has only been scanned five times in the last year? Well, then it becomes relative. If it was scanned five times, but if the table was never updated in the last year, then keeping it around was probably, was probably actually makes sense, you know? But if it was scanned five times in the last year and the table was updated 20 times, and, you know, how do you decide it where, where you draw the line of, I'm going to recommend to the user that they drop this? Um, Yeah, in, in Postgres, you actually have some stats on that. Oh, it, it's keep index usage, usage, read log files by a compulsory log or whatever, and use the same as a query to the index they use. And you can also use keep the query data. So what things I do is keep the query data to like what we call the query review. Oh. The query score, query log is zero, all query time is zero. Um, you log the query, you can have it um, dive into the table. And then what I do is I add some columns. So I add some Yeah, one of the things Baron complains. One of the things that Baron complains about a lot is that the default of what's available, both in Postgres and MySQL, is counters. And counters have a certain limited amount of usefulness um, because, like, you know, here I can take a look at this and I can say, hey, you know, this index has not been scanned any time since whenever it was I last reset the counters. Well, this doesn't tell me is when I last reset the counters. Um, and particularly, one of the things I often want to know is, how many times was index used in the last day? How many was used in the last week? Oh, I just ran a performance test. How many times was it used in the last hour? Mine still does have a yeah. variable that shows when the time 
Yeah. But flushing local. Right. Much yeah. And um, the and and that's I mean it's actually clearly very important here because I can say hey this index has been used eleven thousand times, um, which would be a lot if it was in the last day, but if it's in the last year and a half it's not a lot. Right. Um, you know, so we have some we have some add-on tools to deal with this. There's um, what what is the Japanese one, Christoph? PG Stat. It's the one that actually does a a you know snapshot of your statistics every period. But yeah, okay. Well, the other thing is users like, and now why is my database 500 gigabytes? Yeah. Well, you got 120 gigabytes of data and 380 yeah. gigabytes of indexes. Yeah. 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 So it's sort of a general problem. In the, the, I mean, one of your issues becomes, but I mean, one of the issues is, you know, is. I mean, I don't feel like I have a good grasp to begin with. We have sort of an, as an assortment of tools, and generally those tools are useful for one problem. And they don't really sort of, I mean, even aside from the fact that a lot of people don't know about them and can't find them, um, figuring out, uh, making use, figuring out whether or not your problem is the problem addressed by the tool. Um, I mean, one of the problems that we run into there is that obviously maintaining all these statistics isn't free. Um, and, and any individual statistic is relatively cheap, but we keep adding things and it becomes, you know, an issue to the point where in, what was it, 9.0, yeah, 9.0 we had to basically allow you to move the statistics file to an in-memory, you know, a, a non, you know, a, a non-file handle. Um, because there's too much writing happening. Because in some databases, like particularly, data, and databases where they don't care about it, like you see this particularly, is databases back in queues. So you know, we've got a big Celery implementation or, or um, Apache MQ that's being backed by Postgres. They don't really care about the statistics because they're just adding and appending and, and removing. Um, and, but they're appending and removing very fast, and so the statistics are being updated all the time, and pretty soon you look and you say, hey, the majority of my writes to disk are the statistics file. Um, you know, by, by like 10 times as much as actually writing any data. Um, because most of the data ceases to exist before it hits disk. But the statistics still get updated. 
the Uh, enterprise DB has their enterprise manager thing, but its performance recommendations are relatively rudimentary. Okay. Um, you know, on the level of this index has never been used, or this table has no indexes, you know, or that sort of thing. Um, yeah, although with the enterprise manager you can use separately and you can use it with Postgres. It's not, however, I don't think it's free. Though. I think it's proprietary. I'm not sure. The um, so. Um, there is some of that stuff, and it, and it certainly, but that doesn't help you with the, the problem, you know, that I wanted to bring up, which was, um, uh, you know, this problem. The, you know, why is this query taking five seconds? Um, because, you know, I mean, you, you look at this giant complicated query output and that sort of thing, and I can take a look at it, and I can say, for some strange reason, this particular right here, um, and actually, you go all the way, actually. <laughs> See, this is one of the problems, is even looking at the digested output, I have to go all the way down here and say, oh, hey, this hash join is really slow for some reason. Um, and then try to figure out what that reason is, which I can't really because on the blown up screen, it's wrapping the text. Um, what? Uh, I can't, actually, given the way he's done the layout. The, um, well, I don't know what, I don't actually have the original query, because you don't have to post it to this point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. The, um, there's some of it. I mean, in, po in Postgres land, there are legitimate reasons to write queries this complicated. Um, the, um, and, and, and we have many in Socorro, actually. The, are they, are they all, yeah. Well, because we're doing complicated things where you're doing, um, multiple rankings of, of rows based on different characteristics, and so you have to do common table expressions where you sort the rows over different windows and give the rankings of them, and that sort of thing. The, um, so, um, but, you know, the same thing is that, you know, when, when one of those is slow, it, I mean, it's actually something like this, it actually takes me quite a bit of time to actually look at it and say, why is it slow? Um, and we can't possibly cover all cases, but it seems like, you know, we could take and approach a simpler one to say, okay, here's the different cases where queries are slow, um, and we'll come up with these patterns that we can search for within the query and say, you know, come back. And I think that's where we need to go. But since I don't have any examples, I can't look at another database and say, Oracle does this, DB2 does this, at least not in the, I haven't looked at the Oracle Enterprise Manager because I don't want to pay a million dollars to get access to it. Um, the, um, you know, I look at those and say, um, you know, is that a good way to help average users? You know, or do we need to do something different? That's what I was wondering if anybody had any ideas about. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, well, and that's, and that's what I'm wondering, is that maybe it's, do, do we need to focus on the sort of ultimate, you know, sort of actionable output and say, come up with an, a recommender algorithm that basically says, oh, you know, estimates for table X are way off, you probably want to analyze that table, you know? Or, um, oh, um, you are doing an on-disk sort, um, you're doing an on-disk sort, uh, you know, for 18 megabytes of data, so you probably want to increase work memory, you know? The problem with that sort of thing, with taking that approach, is that none of these things are free. So, for example, the work memory increase, for example, works great on an individual query, but that's a resource limit in Postgres. And if you increase it for the database system in general, you may discover that, yes, you've made some individual queries run faster, but on the whole, you've just run your system out of memory. Um, uh, well, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking about making it more approachable to developers, because right now, with the, the, this, you know, the minute a developer sees something like this, they just give up. Well, except that, that in most cases, the, the case I'm really trying to solve is where there isn't a DBA, okay. because that's actually the majority case these days. Okay. Um, the, um, so, um, you know, because if there is a DBA, if there is a DBA, then, then presumably they can understand this output. Um, and, and, you know, and so the answer is they say my query is slow, and the DBA says give me your query a copy of your query, and I'll try it out and come back and say, okay, I added some indexes. Index recommendation is actually one of those things where I look in the recommendations, often the solution to making the query faster is to add a particular index. But when you get into multi-column indexes, I can't even imagine a programmed algorithm that would work for recommending those. Um, because I do it sort of, I do it by a combination of instinct and trial and error. That is, I've gotten sort of a feel for what multi-column indexes really help um, on complex queries. Um, and I'm right about 50% of the time, you know? And the other 50% of the time I add the multi-column index, it doesn't help at all, and just remove it again. Um, so it's hard for me to imagine, like, some things, like you need to analyze, you need more work memory, um, the, um, this table, going as far as saying this table might need an index, um, is easy enough, um, but actually recommending which, what it needs an index on is, is a lot more complicated. Which it is with Postgres, but yeah. So in that case, being able to start out with a recommendation of um, you're doing a full scan of this large table, you might need an index, would actually be enough. Or, um, and for that matter, in Postgres, we have to recommend, we would want to recommend things like um, you're doing this expensive sort. If there were an index in those conditions, it might be faster, you know, um, you know or, or aggregation, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs>
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. This time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astra or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astra. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments.
you have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center, uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the CloudStack.